So thanks everyone for joining us. I'm going to introduce our panellists. Um, first, we'll hear from Colin Rogerson, who is Head of Fertility Law at Mills and Reeve. Um, Colin's recognised as one of the UK's leading surrogacy and fertility lawyers, and Colin heads the firm's fertility law team. Uh, Colin is ranked band one for cross-border children disputes by the Chamber's Guide and undertakes cases with international dimensions, including child abduction, jurisdiction disputes, and domestic and international relocations. Uh, we're also joined by Alison Bull, a partner who's based in our Manchester office. And Alison is a highly experienced family mediator, financial and children arbitrator, and, a, and lawyer. Um, Alison is recently qualified in cross-border mediation with MIK, M-I-K-K, an international mediation center. Um, Alison is qualified to meet with children in mediation, and we're going to hear more about Alison's experience uh, shortly. We're also enjoy, joined by Janet Floweth, a non-practicing solicitor, professional practice consultant and child inclusive accredited mediator, mediator of AIM Mediation. Uh, Janet's also well known for mediating with Reunite, a charity specialising in international child abduction. And Janet is a member of the Family Mediators Association. Um, and finally, we are joined by Janaina Albuquerque, um, an international lawyer registered in the Brazilian and Portuguese bar associations. Um, Alison, sorry, <laughs> Janaina has extensive academic and professional experience in Brazil and Europe, having worked at the Hague Conference on Private International Law with the team responsible for the 1993 Hague Convention on Intercountry Adoption and the Legislative Project on Kinship and Surrogacy. Janaina is also qualified in cross-border mediation with MIK, M-I-K-K, an international mediation centre. So without further ado, we're going to start with Colin, um, who's going to give an introduction to the law um, and some practical points around child abduction. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Zoe. Um, we've got some great speakers uh, lined up um, today who are going to talk about and the many benefits of mediating these cross-border children cases, including uh, international child abduction. And um, when I was given this 10-minute um, slot, I was told to talk um, for 10 minutes about child abduction law, which is uh, quite a feat. Um, and so what I am going to do is give you an overview of my experience of litigating these cases, often alongside mediation, um, over the years um, and to give some practical points um, going forward for people who are involved in these cases. We can't really talk about mediating child abduction cases um, without dealing with the litigation side and in this area probably more than most other areas particularly of family law mediation often takes place um, in parallel to a litigation process. Um, as a general rule Child abduction cases, particularly in this jurisdiction, um, are often dealt with uh, at a much faster pace um, than other cases that progress through the family courts. Uh, it's a highly specialist area of family law um, where the wrong application can lead to um, unintentionally accepting a jurisdiction or a failure to act quickly enough can lead to a child being removed from the country um, and your client often facing insurmountable hurdles in regaining contact with their child or finding their child and then seeking the return. And so I hope to give you some pointers on how litigation in this area of law should be handled. And if you do end up litigating in parallel proceedings, how those two competing processes can be balanced. And the first is to act quickly, and this is the case whether your client is seeking to prevent removal, seeking the child's return to their country of habitual residence, or if you're responding to an application for return, all of these require decisive action at the outset. And there are a number of things that you have to consider right at the start of this process, uh, particularly if you're for an applicant. The first is to work out which of the international conventions, if any, apply between the relevant member states. Um, the status tables on the Hague Conference website provide a full list, um, but they are quite challenging to read. Um, and it's important to check if there are any reservations or, or acceptance procedures that are in place. For example, if you look at the 1980 Child Abduction Hague Convention status table, you'll see that Thailand has um, entered the 1980 Hague Convention into force. 
but the UK has not accepted its accession. And so that means that in a UK Thailand case, the 1980 Hague abduction, um, Hague abduction convention doesn't apply, um, but it does, for example, between Thailand and the US. Secondly, um, an important factor that we need to consider is whether or not to start the application with or without notice. When I started doing these cases uh, over 10 years ago, I think it's probably fair to say that nearly all abduction cases um, started on a without notice application. Um, but the tides have very much changed now um, and you really do need to justify why um, applying without notice is justified and it's not always an easy decision um, to balance and as lawyers we instinctively think of worst case scenarios the worst case scenario in terms of whether you decide to give notice uh, if you if you choose to give notice um, and that decision was perhaps the wrong one is that the responder to the application may abduct uh, or may uh, abduct onwards um, to another country um, and it's important to take this um, consideration because um, on a return date even if you get past the first hurdle of getting your, your without notice order um, you may be faced with the less than happy judge often who is faced with um, a respondent who comes before them with a position of I didn't intend to take the child anywhere um, and costs may be applied for and in some cases have been granted. People who work in, in law firms, even if um, you, your firm doesn't undertake legal aid, you need to be aware that, of the legal aid eligibility in this area because in some cases, for example, an applicant in a 1980 Hague case is going to be eligible for non-means, non-merits legal aid. Uh, and applicants and respondents in other cases um, will be subject, will be eligible to legal aid subject to a means and merits legal aid test. Again, this is important because if you fail to advise a client um, who would be eligible for legal aid, that legal aid might be available, um, they may come back at a later stage and um, recover those costs from you. And I can certainly remember one of my cases in my early years of recovering £20,000 from some private solicitors who have to advise the client um, to, um, that they may be eligible for legal aid. Um, there may be um, the option of port alerts or tip staff orders. Tip staff orders include port, um, passport orders, location orders and collection orders. Um, and it's also worth noting that a tip staff port alert that is implemented um, might be more reliable than port alerts that are independently imposed by the police. Uh, but again, you need to justify these on a case by case basis, whereas in years past, we probably didn't need to. Uh, and these were put into place as a matter of course. I think it's important when we're advising clients about the availability of tip staff orders to think about the impact on the respondent and the child. They're, they're usually executed by uniformed police officers on behalf of the tip staff. And so how is that going to impact the litigation going forward if the, a uniformed police officer turns up at the house where they're believed to be staying, um, often a family member's house, um, possibly have fled domestic abuse um, and to have the police knocking on the door to serve them with that order. It's important to bear that in mind and balance that against the risks um, of onward abduction and so they should only be obtained where they're absolutely necessary. Another practical tip, um, which is one that I've seen uh, other lawyers fall foul of, um, if you're applying for an order that requires um, a party to surrender a non-UK passport, that application has to be made before a High Court judge because only High Court judges under the inherent jurisdiction have um, the power to remove those passports. Um, and a judge not of a High Court level sitting in the Family Court has the power to remove a British passport, but not, for example, a French or American or Indian or Pakistani passport. Um, once the litigation process is underway, beware of the timelines involved. The current guidelines for both Hague and non-Hague cases state that cases should be heard within six weeks of the date of issue. Now, I don't think that we would see many of those time, timelines met in most of the abduction cases, but it's still around about three to four months. And in other jurisdictions, 
and I know I think Janina has some experience of this um, with Brazil, um, they're perhaps not quite as um, quick as getting through um, the process. But even if your application is made of on notice, it's not uncommon to receive a listing for hearing within 24 hours um, or later that week. So you have to be prepared to act quickly uh, and prepare your client um, for the very real chance that um, we are not going to have the luxury of, of planning when the hearing is going to take place and they might be expected to drop everything and turn up to court. Um, if you are for an applicant, it's important to anticipate what issues may be raised by the respondent and to have difficult conversations, often difficult conversations with your clients about proposals, um, for example, for undertakings to ensure what we call um, soft landing provisions, um, which may help head off some of the common defences that arise. And some of the most common undertakings that I see applicants give in child abduction cases are things like not to seek to separate the child from the respondent on return, to provide temporary accommodation and temporary financial support pending a return hearing in the country of habitual residents, and not to actively pursue any criminal sanctions against the respondent, not to turn up at the airport of arrival, and to give some general non-molestation undertakings. But of course, each case is going to be fact specific. Some issues may require the assistance of the International Judicial Liaison Network. Uh, and for our, in our jurisdiction, this is facilitated through the Office of the Head of International Family Justice, who is currently Lord Justice Moylan. Um, and this can be used to get swift answers from the country of habitual residents of the state of play with any proceedings in that jurisdiction, or some basic understanding of the impact of any orders that have been made. Expert evidence may be required from local lawyers about issues relating to rights of custody. And it's also important not to assume that interpretation of foreign orders are given the same interpretation that we would give. A common one, for example, is that a court order in the foreign jurisdiction might say that the mother has custody, um, but it doesn't say anything about leave to remove. And we might assume, therefore, that that means custody or the child should live with the mother in that jurisdiction. Um, but we can't assume that. So talk to foreign lawyers. If your client has a foreign lawyer, make sure you're checking with them um, to make sure you understand the implications of any orders that have been made. If there are TIP staff orders, um, remember that these have to be reviewed at each and every hearing. And the TIP staff are only going to act on a sealed order. Um, so an approved draft from the judge's clerk won't do. Um, so you need to keep on top of counsel if you're instructing counsel over the, the drafting of the order so that the order is sent to the court as soon as possible. Finally, there are some practical tips when we're talking about mediating alongside litigation. Sometimes um, it's necessary to issue proceedings, for example, to preserve jurisdiction or to hold the ring if you're concerned about further abductions. And it might be advisable. Um, because um, proceedings can help keep the urgency um, of the situation to hand and may dissuade one party from um, using mediation to prolong the process. But there are some factors that I think are quite useful um, when you're litigating to consider if you are mediating alongside it. And first of all, if the court timetable allows for it, consider with your client, the other side, and ultimately um, the judge, in seeking to delay the filing of evidence. I'm sure our mediators will have all had situations where they've tried to mediate situations where mediation appointments have fallen in the afternoon when evidence has been filed in the morning. Uh, and it's probably not the best conducive to um, seeking a, a mediated outcome. Um, contemplate if you think that there is a reasonable prospect of the mediation being successful, um, considering um, whether to um, stay the proceedings or to adjourn any final hearing to allow that mediation to conclude. A mediation, mediated agreement is going to be much likely um, to be better received all around than one that's judicially imposed on them um, by the parties. And finally, but I think importantly, and this is something that I've certainly picked up over my years of practicing in this area, it is remember that the abduction process is usually just one piece in a much larger jigsaw. 
And it's easy for us as lawyers to compartmentalise the tasks that we've been instructed to deal with. Um, so work closely with counterparts in foreign jurisdictions with the other lawyers and think holistically. Is it really a win to secure a child's return if the receiving country will inevitably return the child to England within a matter of weeks or months of their return? And so with that, I will hand over to Alison. Thank you, Colin. Before I let Alison start, I forgot to say at the start, we are having questions. As, um, and so there is a Q&A chat. So pop your questions in. I'm going to uh, deal with them at the end. So you're welcome to pop questions in as we go along, but it will be at the end that I'll look at those. Thank you. Thanks, Alison. Thanks, Zoe. Thanks, Colin. OK, so I'm going to talk briefly about how to access mediation organisations involved in child abduction, a bit about how mediation works in these tricky cases and a bit about the types and the format of mediation. And then Janet's going to talk to you about more about the realities of mediating these cases. Because she's been mediating in this area far more than uh, than I ha have or am, um, because a lot of my work is mediating financial cases and, and non-abduction children cases, just with some cross-border work. But first, I just wanted to dispel the myth that mediation can't work in difficult cases. And um, I think Janet will also touch on this. Um, you know, child abduction cases at first sight are completely polarised and apparently impossible uh, to resolve. But in my experience, you know, firstly, parents are not daft. They know their kids can only go to school, for example, in one place. Um, and secondly, the priority of the vast majority of parents is their children's best interests. There can be a disconnect between that in theory and how things play out in practice. But this factor is so influential in mediation. And thirdly, an all-out court battle is actually not what the majority of people want. And as Collins just alluded to, that initial court battle is very often not the end of the story. So why not try to resolve everything um, uh, at the outset, if possible, by agreement? So Janina will talk later about some of the most difficult cases. And where there's domestic abuse prevalent, then obviously great caution is needed. I'm not going to talk further about that now, but I'll just say that you know mediation may still be possible, but with caution. And if anyone is in any doubt about how mediation can work, then I'd suggest you take a look at the reported case in Al Khatib and Masri in the Court of Appeal in 2002. And in, in that case, there were five children who'd been abducted by their father from France to Saudi Arabia. Uh, and they weren't returned for over four years. There were all sorts of conflict in the background. He was subject to a European arrest warrant. Uh, there were lo lots of, uh, anything you can think of had happened in that case. There was a six day mediation, which took place against the backdrop of an appeal against the order of a high court judge, and it was successful. And Lord Justice Thorpe said that that can, supports our conviction that there is no case, however conflicted, which is not potentially open to successful mediation, even if mediation has not been attempted or has failed during the trial process. So if you're involved in a child abduction case, how can you help the parents to access specialist mediation and what organisations are out there? And there are two main not-for-profit organisations uh, that offer telephone advice and specialist mediation in these cases uh, in different ways. And they work very closely with governments and organisations uh, across the world. And the first is Reunite, uh, the leading charity in the UK that uh, Janet works with. And, and she'll talk more about that uh, and her practice short, shortly. And the second is MIC, which has already referred to before, which stands for Mediation by Internationalen Kinderschaftskonflikten. Uh, it's based in Berlin in Germany and operates across Europe with EU funding and more widely. And Beishani Ina and I trained as cross-border child abduction mediators with MIC, well, about a year ago uh, now. So Reunite has a team of mediators who work for the organisation, and Janet can correct me if I get any of this wrong later. <laughs> um, it offers legally aided mediation to parents who are, who are eligible. And mediation is accessed through Reunite by parents contacting the organisation, uh, completing a questionnaire that's available on the website or phoning them, and then going through an initial separate assessment meeting, and in a, if appropriate, meeting together with the mediator in the usual way, whether in person or remotely. Uh, MIC operates differently, providing a large network of independent mediators, there are currently 195 mediators, 
who speak 35 languages and operate um, across 36 countries. Uh, they're all appropriately trained and listed on the, uh, the website. And referrals can either be through the MIC office or can be directly to the mediators uh, listed on the website. And the MIC mediation model is a co-mediation model, or perhaps more accurately, it's the 4B model, bilingual, biculture,al biprofessional and by gender. Uh, so the aim is that um, uh, all MIC mediations will take place with two mediators and where possible, reflecting uh, the identities of the parents. Many of the mediators are also lawyers um, and there are a significant number from uh, other backgrounds. So, for example, I have a mediation coming up involving German and British nationals. I'm one of the mediators and my co-mediator is a German national from a social work background. The costs tend to be very much lower in these settings than, uh, than in a commercial setting. And you can access both organisations through the websites if you just uh, Google them. So I'll talk a little bit about how mediation works in these cases. And the process is very similar to any family mediation in some ways with separate initial screening meetings. If appropriate, then joint meetings, either remotely or in person, legal advice in the background, and the involvement of children and young people through a meeting with the mediators where appropriate. I think Janet's going to touch on this as well. And resulting in a memorandum of understanding, recording the consensus that has been reached, subject to legal advice and conversion of the agreement into a court order or orders where relevant and possible in both, or sometimes there are more than two jurisdictions concerned. And one difference, which of course Collins touched on already, is the speed at which the mediation may need to be conducted to fit uh, within any ongoing court process. So it can often take place within quite a short period of time um, with a series of longer meetings uh, and where necessary over the weekend. And of course, significant in these cases are the heightened emotions in play. I mean, a fear of losing your child is a nightmare for any parent and having that happen is awful. Uh, similarly, feeling you've no option but to leave the country with your child without discussing it with a parent or remaining in the country after a holiday, um, supposedly a temporary stay without the consent of the other, other parent suggests, you know, at, at best, a very difficult home situation. And inevitably, these situations arise where there are difficult personal relationships between the parents and very often a complete breakdown of communication that may have been a problem for a long time. On the positive side, it's far more likely that a mediated agreement between parents will be adhered to uh, than an outcome imposed by the court. And for parents just to feel listened to in mediation can make a huge difference. And in addition, because in these cases, there are often more than two potential countries involved, the best outcome for all concerned may be an option that's not open uh, to the court to order other than by consent. And parents, of course, know their children's be needs best and are in the best position to be able to work out what is the least worst option for them. So whether the young person or people concerned should be returned may be the pressing legal question for the court. But as, as Collins alluded to, for the parents, there are many other practical issues that need to be sorted out, uh, depending on where the child ends up having their primary home. And um, this is particularly so when an immediate return was, which might be the the likely option, but will often uh, not be the end of the matter, but just the start of a potentially much longer process of the courts um, to decide whether the abducting parent should be permitted to take the young person uh, overseas permanently. So the uncertainty, the stress and the cost of all of this is huge for parents. And of course, that inevitably has a huge impact also on their children. So the arrangements that need to be sorted out, you know, vary. They can need to agree on the amount of time and the location of the time that children will spend with each parent. And that can be particularly difficult depending on distance, time differences. All of those travel arrangements need to be made. The financial consequences that Colin alluded to as well, which can be from travel costs to how living expenses will be covered during time spent with the young person or if there's a return or if they're going to stay in the country where they have been abducted to. Important is ongoing contact with you know, the young people's friends, their other family and all the other arrangements that would usually form part of a parenting plan, but they have to be shoehorned as best possible into a short time frame and against the threat or incentive, depending on perspective, 
of a potential legal order enforcing a peremptory return of the child to the to the country they've been abducted from. And sometimes two or more outcomes can be considered in mediation and potentially um, agreed subject to um, a, a court decision on the return issue. So where there can't be an agreement actually on that, it's possible to work on two different scenarios which could work if uh, depending on that outcome. Types of mediation, you know, the time pressure of mediation in these cases means that um, it's important to have as many tools in your mediation toolkit as possible. It's really important. So, you know, these include shuttle or hybrid mediation where the parents are in separate rooms virtually or actually and with the mediators holding confidences between those rooms. Um, involving the party's lawyers in the mediation, if that's practical, sometimes with separate lawyers meetings to address legal issues and usually using a combination of meetings together and separately holding confidences. Of course, involving the children and young people in the mediation and always focusing throughout on what's in their best interests. It can be really hard for parents to step outside of their parental battle and they're all prevalent fear about what might happen and actually focus on their children's needs. Um, when I've met with children and young people in mediation, in my experience, they talk a great deal of sense, often more sense than their parents. Um, uh, and they tend to be realistic, sensible, and there's always something that comes out of those meetings that give their, gives their parents food for thought. I think Janet's going to talk more about that. So I'll just explain some of the basic rules about children, uh, child inclusive mediation, so meeting with children in mediation before I hand over. So first, the content of those meetings with children in mediation will not be reported to the court. And that's something that seems to be commonly misunderstood in the courts in England and Wales, not just in the context of child abduction. Secondly, the children speak in confidence with the mediator and content will only be shared with their parents with the children's express uh, consent, unless, of course, there are, there's risk of harm and so on. Thirdly, uh, these meetings will only happen if the mediators are as confident as possible. The parents are not going to coach or grill their children and will take on board any messages. So in other words, it won't be a negative experience for the children. And lastly, everyone needs to be clear that the decisions are still going to be taken by the parents, not meeting with the children so they can make those decisions. Which I think brings me on nicely to handing over to you, Janet. OK, thanks ever so much, Alison. Um, uh, I am the uh, supervisor for Reunite. Um, we do have a team, like Alison said. Unfortunately, um, we can't do the by language uh, mediation, we do rely an awful lot on interpreters. Um, basically, we've been mediating these cases since 2002 at Reunite. I've been doing them for about 10 years now. I do, on average, three to four of these a month, which are mainly abduction, can be Article 21, possibly um, a, relo a relocation mediation as well. If I just bore you with some statistics, in um, 2020, we mediated over 80 cases. In 2021, that was over 70, which obviously the pandemic had an impact on some of that. And in 2022, we mediated over 86 cases. 51 of those were incoming 1980 Hague abduction cases. Six were outgoing 1980 Hague abduction cases. Eight were incoming non-Hague abduction cases. And two were outgoing non-Hague abduction cases. 14 of them were 1980 Hague Article 21 cases. And five of them were relocation cases. So I also hope those explanations made sense to people who aren't familiar <laughs> with the language. A pilot scheme was started in 2018 in the High Court that um, a mediator would be present in the High Court every day at the usually the directions hearings, and the parents would be invited to pop along and speak to the mediator. Um, that 
wasn't Lee uh, enormously successful in uh, my experience because the parents were match fit. They were there with their lawyers. They were preparing for a court hearing. They were really anxious. Um, feelings were very high. But at least they would get the opportunity to meet with one of us and then possibly um, at a later date could say whether or not they were willing to consider mediation. It is important to pick up on what Alison said as well, that they are referred out for an assessment meeting, not mediation itself, because mediation is always voluntary. And I think recently as well, some of the high court judges are sort of telling people they have to and, and you know, mediation is always a voluntary process. Um, the practice guidance was changed during the pandemic so that solicitors are now asked to send the contact details of Reunite to their clients when they're in these cases. Um, I think Alison touched on the fact that the majority of the cases that we do are funded by legal aid. The legal aid agency will also pay for a parent um, cost to be able to travel to the UK if they want to mediate face to face. I don't think we've done any face to face cases really since the lockdown. Um, we used to do them, um, but um, since the lockdown, we've been doing them all by Zoom. Um, I think the challenges uh, for getting people to mediation is that the parents are quite often unaware of mediation um, and they need legal support to engage in mediation. They need the support of the judiciary and they also need financial support. The government voucher scheme is is something that we're also using now at Reunite because that will pay up to £500. Um, an applicant parent um, is the same as in the litigation process. They get non-means, non-merits tested legal aid to help them in the mediation. Um, in terms of why I went into mediation, and I think looking at some examples of mine from the coal fakes, and I always sound like some sort of evangelist when I talk about this particular case, but I think it really demonstrated to me as a former litigator why mediation could be so powerful. It was one of the first cases I ever did, and it was um, an Australian father and a British mother. They were living together in Australia, had their child in Australia, separated, and I think they took each other to court in Australia for every single thing you could possibly take a person to court for in family law. And dad agreed for the mum to bring the six-year-old boy over to the UK for a holiday. And when she got back, she just didn't want to go back. And they came to mediation after dad had started his Hague application. And it was a face-to-face -face mediation. And they started off. And, and what we always say to parents is usually the first session can be really hard because there's a lot of bottled up feeling. And they've been speaking through lawyers. They've not been talking at all. Or they do a very quick hello when they're setting up a remote contact session with the child. And the father finally said about it, two or three hours in that he would agree to the little boy staying in the UK and the transformation in the room was just amazing and they both started talking to each other and that was the first time they had done that in years and I just sat on the seat like a Wimbledon spectator just amazed that they were doing that and that the tension in the room just went and and I always talk about that case when I talk to anybody about training to be a mediator because it it really really just stunned me that that um you know that could happen and you know they went off and they agreed all the contact times and the travel arrangements and and everything and and you know it was just really amazing I think if we're honest um what we what we um, produce at the end of a mediation session is an, an MOU, a Memorandum of Understanding. And I think our um, uh, MOU rate has gone down. And I think there's possibly two reasons for that. I think the pandemic has possibly 
changed people. And I also think an impact of the pandemic are because we were mediating with cases. I was mediating a case with an Australian mother and an English father living in Dubai. Mum went to Australia just before lockdown. And, and you know what? Anybody can remember what Australia's rules around the lockdown were. She was trapped there for months. He couldn't get out there. She couldn't get out. Um, so I think parents have become more aware that now there is a risk that suddenly they won't be able to move between countries as easily as they used to do. Um, our MOUs, like Alison touched on, if the parents really, really, really cannot agree the country, we say to them, well, let's look at the two different scenarios then. Um, I did one a couple of weeks ago. They were in court for their final hearing the following week. And I said, OK, so now it's the 12th of September. The judge has made the decision. How is that going to work for you and the children? OK, so let's look at the scenario where the children stay in England. Let's look at the scenario where the children are sent back. And that can really help the parents think about the future because they're so caught up in the now and the conflict and the litigation that when you actually start talking practically to them in a calm environment about how often realistically can you pay for travel? How often is it going to fit in with the children's holidays, the ages of the children? all of that sort of thing and it can really help them start to think about what the future might look like um so um what is a successful mediation do we have to get a, a, a total agreement or if we can agree anything and help them think about the future i think that's a success quite honestly um as some of our lawyers of of got back to us and said, well, I know we didn't get an outcome, but since they've mediated, they're, they're different in their approach to this litigation. I think um, the point that Colin made as well is quite often in mediation to help them understand that it might not be over, because if the parent is um, ordered to go back they are going to make, they say quite clearly in mediation, well, as soon as, you know, we land, I'm going to make an application for leave to return and to remove. Um, and, you know, again, that can sort of shock people into thinking this isn't over. And again, as a mediator, we are always trying to focus on the impact of that on the children, you know, taking them out of school, settling them in another school, and then three months later, they're going out of school back again so you know that is what can be really helpful I think in mediation for the parents um, I'm a child inclusive mediator which means I can speak to the child like Alison said um, they always astound me with a how quickly they're willing to talk about it because I'm thinking you've got to be really sensitive here how you ask the questions and everything and b some of the maturity which they display in, uh, you know, what their parents are doing um, is quite often remarkable, really, whatever their age is. I wouldn't normally speak to a child under 10 years of age. I know some mediators do. Our guidance as mediators says we shouldn't really be speaking to children under 10 I think in some of these international cases as well, these children and young people have spoken to quite a lot of people about the situation. You know, they may well have spoken to the CAFCAS officer. They may have a guardian. They may have their own solicitor. And I think sometimes we have to be mindful of the fact that they are just bombarded with adults saying, well, tell me what you think and everything. But I did want to share um, some of the quotes from some young people I had spoken to. Um, one of them was a 14 year old and his parents had been litigating for 10 years in two different countries and he was retained in England. And he said, I can't really imagine a life where they're not in court. It's been going on for so long. After everything has ended, it's hard to imagine a life where seeing my mum and dad could be stable. 
my life has been unstable with this conflict. So it would be nice if it ended and it wouldn't just benefit me, but everyone. I also spoke to two uh, girls out of a sibling group of three. And obviously the 12 year old was the only one relevant to the proceedings, but she had her 17 year old sister with her and they had, were from a South Asian family who had um, returned, to, uh, come to England from California. And they were saying, dad wasn't really happy about it, but we wanted to come. There were no family members in California. It feels more like a proper family in England. And I see dad's family too. We think he's making the court application to show he cares. He is a man that wants everything for himself. And if you don't do it, he gets mad. I also spoke to a 15 year old girl who was living in England, who um, had a father in South Africa. And I think the court orders around her had been made when she was about five years old. And the expectation was that she would go back to South Africa for at least 50 percent of her summer holiday. And she said, I'm 15. Those orders were made when I was five. I want to stay here now with my friends and I want to go and play netball and hang out. I'm not a five-year-old child anymore. And then finally, another 15-year-old boy I spoke to recently said, um, I love you, mum. And if you love me, and I know I'm being selfish here, let me go and don't keep on fighting as it isn't helpful for me. And what I'd like to end with, if I can master of the technology is a video that we took it's it's a bit clunky because it was done um uh, by a mobile phone so i do apologize for the quality but it's a video that we did of some of our parents who had used reunite mediation um and um, i i again on those days sometimes when you maybe question why do i do the job i do I watched this video and was again just blown away by how mediation had really helped these parents. So just bear with me. Here we go. Right, can I? Can you? Question to whether I would recommend mediation to others. I have a clear yes. I definitely would recommend mediation to others. I believe that my and our case shows that mediation was probably the reason why we got back on speaking ground and which is the reason why I today, me as well as my family, my new family, has a good contact with our daughter. I would recommend the mediation to all the parents. If they have a problem, even just like this, you don't need to fight. You don't need to make arguments and go straight to the courts and make it a state thing and big thing. You just need to listen to each other and find the, sol the best solution not for you or for yourself, but for the children. At the end of the day, this has minimised the impact on my children, which is the most important thing for me. I think mediation allows people to take a deep breath and calm down and, and actually think about what really matters. When there is no hope, mediation is the possibility that can bring back a potential light at the end of the tunnel. Has changed our life for better. That's the the word. You know, change our life. Okay. Um. I hope you could all see that. I'll just pass on to Janaina now. Thank you. Hey, thank you very much, Janet. Um, first of all, I'd like to express my gratitude to to Mills and Reeve and in particular Alison for the kind invite. Um, so my name is Anaína and I'm originally from Brazil, but I, I'm based in Portugal now and I, I have worked in both fronts as a mediator and as a lawyer. Um, but today when I was thinking about whatever we were and upon our discussions, what I was going to explore here, um, I figured that Portugal is a EU, EU member, so things are a bit more standardized since Portugal is, is subject to the Brussels regulations and it would be a, perhaps a bit more interesting to explore a non-European perspective and bring uh, out my Brazilian experience for you. And therefore, I'd like to talk about two different angles involving international child abduction and mediation. 
And those will be mediation when one of the parties is not European and mediation in child abduction, in particular in Brazil. So with my first uh, talking point, uh, mediation involving a non-European party, uh, the challenges we face in 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 cross border mediation is is also the same. We know we have some some similar topics. For example, there will be language barriers. Uh, perhaps there will be different time zones. There will be some cultural differences, some different social cues to handle, and that always happens regardless of the nationality of the parents. But when we are talking about a parent that is not European. Uh, there are other kinds of vulnerabilities that come into play. And as mediators, we follow a, a set of principles to conduct mediation. For example, we're going to follow the principle of confidentiality, or we're going to follow the principle of voluntary participation. But there's one core principle that is very important, which is the principle of equality between the parties. So as mediators, we have to make sure that the parties are at equal stance and there's not a, a gross disbalance of power dynamics between the parents. And when we're talking about one, uh, one of the parties not being European, things are a little bit more challenging as in there are additional challenges to the mediation itself. Um, one thing that I have observed in those kinds of mediations is that the further the distance, the more tense is going to be the conversation. Because when one of the parents cannot just hop on a plane and in a couple hours be in a different place and go for a weekend or so, when it comes to the child being in a different continent, perhaps, and that parent only seeing the child in person once, perhaps luckily twice a year for two or three weeks, it's a little bit more complicated. So um, that really it brings a, a, an additional layer of, of complexity to the situation itself. Um, also, there are other things that might be relevant to the situation, such as the non-European parents might have some dependencies on the European parents. So for example, that, that parent who is not European might be financially dependent on that parent. They might not have a job in the country of the child's habitual residence. So that whether that be because they don't really speak the language fluently or because they don't have yet a work visa or because it's a little bit harder to integrate into the market, um, there's usually some sort of financial dependency that, that is uh, important and relevant to, to the conversation and to the mediation. Uh, with that comes also the fact that that parent might not have a permanent or fixed residency, might not have a rental contract of their own. So as family lawyers, we know that financial stability and having a fixed residence is important for custody disputes. And when we talk about a non-European parent who might also face some difficulties, not only in regard to the financial situation, but the fact that uh, as an immigrant myself, it can be a little bit more difficult to find a place to stay. Um, and also um, there should be, there can be some, some other logistical issues. It, it, it's, it, it brings a lot more questions uh, as in where am I going to stay? Am I going to, am I going to be able to afford a rent of my own? Am I going to be able to afford a place where we're going to have decent conditions to, for me and, and my child? Um, oh, another thing that al always comes um, into the conversation, not I won't say always all the time, but um, within my Brazilian experience and the cases I have come in contact with, so I'm gonna I'm gonna restrain myself to the to the cases that I have uh, seen and, and experienced. Brazil is a country that has more incoming child abduction cases than outgoing, which means that. Brazil receive, receives more requests to return than asks for the country to return the children. Um, and I, uh, par apart from my work as a lawyer, as a mediator, I, I do uh, a, a voluntary legal assistance to an NGO that helps Brazilian women in Europe with custody disputes and international child abduction. And according to the latest report of that organization, which is called Revibra, in 98% of the cases, whether they be um, when they are judicial, like um, when there is all already a judicial hate proceeding case, in 98% of those cases, there will be some allegation of domestic abuse. And in cases which are still at the preventative uh, level uh, stage or uh, they are still at, at the administrative stage of the hate proceedings, 
there is allegations of abuse. There are allegations of, of abuse in 89% of the situation. So it's always a lot more challenging and we have to have, as Alison mentioned, more caution with those types of cases. But um, in mediation, that actually could help to some extent. Firstly, because online mediation means that the parties will not be in the same place. So there is a, a level of protection. Um, also shuttle mediation, as in when what the mediator will talk to the parties se separately is also an option. And something, depending on the level of, of abuse, and that is something that you have to be really careful with analyzing if the discrepancy of, of power dynamics between the parties is too much to overcome. Um, but when it's still manageable to, to some regard and with a lot of caution, um, mediation is the best opportunity for people to state whatever they really want and to have a say in the outcome of, of, the, of the situation. Um, so it, it's encouraged regardless. However, it must be taken into account that it can be it, it can be raised and uh, as as such as in a compar in a comparative uh, effort um, that usually comes because Brazilian women they when they abduct children to Brazil they are very used to the Brazilian legal system and we have a very robust legislation in terms of of protection um, against domestic violence and child protection. So it's often quite hard for them to understand that that does not apply to international matters. But without getting too much further into that topic, because it could be many panels of their own, um, I will go on and uh, to say that oh, what uh, again, um, still in the in regard to mediation involving non-European parents, one thing that can happen either at the mediation stage or before uh, before a Hague proceeding happens or during a custody uh, hearing or something like that, I would just like to share um, one impression that I had with the one particular case that the couple, it was not even a, a Hague proceeding of its own, it was a custody matter. And the, the parents had mediated, it was a Brazilian woman and a Portuguese um, father, and they had mediated and come to an agreement, and we had a hearing with the judge for her to say whether the, the agreement was fine and to recognize the agreement. And they had settled on a clause that the child would be able to go with the mother twice a year to Brazil. And the judge had a problem with that clause because just because of the fact that the mother was Brazilian and she clearly stated that she was a potential abductor, um, even so, even though the parents had agreed upon those terms. Uh, so there is the fear of stigmatization during custody proceedings and especially after the return, if there is a custody um, proceeding the country of habitual residence after Hague abduction uh, proceeding and the child is returned. So um, apart from those challenges, I would like to also shed some light on child abduction and mediation in Brazil in particular, just to, to, to give you another perspective on how that works when it's not um, done in Europe or in, in the UK. Uh, as Colin mentioned, yes, it is quite impossible to handle the cases within the deadline of six weeks in Brazil. Um, just to give you an example, after this panel, I'm going to have a, a court hearing for child abduction. And um, this is a case where the mother initiated the return proceedings four days after the Hague abduction had happened, and that was over a year ago. So only now, after one year, we're having the first hearing. And that is quite a long time, and it was quite expeditious. <laughs> the The judge was very quick um, to to to, yeah, to react to the case itself. Um, that being said, uh, I, uh, me and Janet, we had a conversation that Brian and I did a training with the Brazilian courts a few weeks ago, a few months ago. And even though there have been efforts to train people and to, to conduct mediations and cross-border mediations for child abduction, it is still quite unusual, I would say. Uh, so mediation or conciliation, that's also something that um, in Brazil, there is at least within our legal system, there is a difference that conciliation would be more appropriate when the parties don't have a pre-existing relationship and mediation would be done when the parties have a more close relationship, a personal relationship. Also, the roles of the mediator and conciliator differ, but in any case, I, I digress. Um, in any case, they are kind of they kind of mix the purpose of both, and we can hear both conciliation hearing or mediation session. Um, and 
um, the mediation is not exactly offered in the way we expect or the way that has been described here. So either mediation or conciliation will come up in two stages, let's say. First of all, still at the administrative phase, so the central authority will suggest uh, conciliation, but in, in many of my cases, there has been it has been suggested that a meeting was held or a session was held and there would be someone to conduct it. Uh, it would be more of a back and forth writing proposal going on. So one party sends a proposal and then the other party gives a counter offer. And if it, it doesn't work, they will follow through with the judicial uh, proceedings. And um, the second uh, the second possibility of mediation or conciliation happening would be that after the, the court proceedings are initiated, mediation will be conducted by the judge of the case. And that is quite unusual because that's not really the, the purpose of mediation. Uh, the judge should not be involved at that phase. And it ends up being more of a vetting kind of situation that the judge he has a preliminary hearing of the parties and there's not really an effort to to make them work together for a solution also i noticed that the parties are a little bit hesitant or not comfortable enough to to say what they want because they they fear that it could have implications in the in the court proceedings so that is quite odd another core difference i'd say is that child inclusive mediation is not a thing is not allowed and even during my training uh, for the accreditation in Brazil, I raised that issue if children would be allowed to participate. And it was uh, a categorical no, uh, it's not a place for the child to, to participate. And that could even cause troubles with the recognition of the agreement itself. So children are not involved, and that is a very big difference. Um, and not to be, uh, I don't, I don't want to say that mediation is not going to work for for non-European parties or or in Brazil, it's not that. Uh, I have had experiences where mediation was uh, very successful uh, in regard to the undertakings, especially because okay, the Hague Convention does not cover criminal aspects, but it covers the civil aspects. But countries have the discretion to enact laws to criminalize, and quite often there will be some sort of criminal charges and then the 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 the, mo the biggest concern of the, these mothers is that with the criminal proceedings comes prohibition to enter the territory and if it's a european case to to enter the schengen area so if it's an eea state there will be concerns that the mother will not even even be allowed to come back to to the state to participate in the in the custody dispute and the custody proceedings um, so mediation can work quite well uh, for undertakings and to, as Colin mentioned, to make sure that the parent will be able to return who the child uh, is going to stay with during these proceedings, uh, some sort of provisional financial support between the parents, um, and also when the child is going to come back, uh, who, who is going to accompany the child, and so on and so forth. Uh, also, mediation works best, uh, I see, when it does in package agreements, so the parents also want to already establish everything, custody and, and maintenance and, and uh, holidays and everything, but I see that especially, and this is very niche to, to non-European parents, because mediation for those cases can help open their eyes to the, to the disparities that could have if custody proceedings were held without knowing the particularities of the other system. For instance, I had a situation in which the judge did not really anticipate that the holidays in the Southern Hemisphere would be different. So it was impossible for the other parents to comply with the custody arrangements because the holidays, the, the, the summer holidays in Brazil are in the in between December and, and January, not July and August. So mediation can also help to personalize the arrangements and come up with a more feasible and of course, as Ellenson said, to make it more uh, better for the for the for the parties to actually implement the agreements. And yeah, I think I, I have already spoken a little bit over my time, but thank you very much. And I will uh, give my yeah, follow up with I think Zoe. Yes, thank you very much, Janaina. Um, and thank you to all the speakers for being um, pretty good at sticking to their time. We've had a couple of questions. Um, I'm going to just take two and just confirm that there is going to be a recording of this or there is a recording of this and it will be sent out to all the delegates probably overnight. It won't necessarily come this evening. Um, so the first uh, question, I think, which Colin and I will take 
um, there's a case where the children have been retained in France and father contacted um, ICACU, the International Child Abduction Central Unit, on the 18th of July. Mother was notified, asked to voluntarily return the children. She submitted a defence and nothing seems to have happened since. You know, what action should be, if any, should be taken from the UK? Um, I mean, this is a fairly typical situation. It does sound like something's happening given that proceedings have commenced and a defence has been filed. So there's obviously proceedings in train in France. My initial view um, is that it's these cases are fact specific. Is that if there's orders which will benefit the situation to be obtained um, on the ground in uh, England that may assist with a return. Um, I mean, Colin spoke about some of the orders that are available earlier, then those orders can be obtained. But I think many of our panellists would say, well, how about mediation as well? <laughs> um, so, Colin, did you have anything to add? I mean, it does sound to me like things are in train and there is a process afoot uh, and, you know, the, the client can liaise with their French attorney, their French avocat. Yeah, I, 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 I would agree with that. I mean, I think that it's always there's always an option to issue proceedings here if, if the habitual residence is here. Um, but I think some judges would say we want to wait and let the French courts do, see see what they do with the Hague Convention application. Um, so perhaps try and get an update first from ICACI, um, because they will usually contact their counterparts in, in the French Central Authority uh, and ask for an update if it's an issue with that. Um, you know, speak to the French lawyer, get an idea of the timescales, dates of hearings uh, and what have you, and then take it from there. But certainly you could bring an application, particularly now Mr Justice must is retired, it might be slightly easy for us to do that. Um, but um, you certainly could bring an application here if the children are habitually resident here, um, primarily under the Children Act, I imagine. Thank you, Colin. And then the second question, which was the last one we got time for, I'm going to put to Janet. It's can the courts halt proceedings? Can the courts say, no, we're having an adjournment until you've tried mediation? I mean, this is a real hot topic, as we all know, and there's lots of debates and discussion. But Janet, I'll throw that hot yeah. potato at you. Um, I think like Alison was saying, when I first started, the, the time constraint was really narrow, that the referral through to mediation came quite late in the day and we would do nine hours over a day and a half. So we would do three hours on in an afternoon and then six hours the following day um, and hopefully get a, a memorandum of understanding at the end. And obviously we were taking into account time zones and things, you know, people stumbling out of bed in America or wanting to go to bed in Australia. I think since the practice guidance has been in, I think the referrals come through to us sooner so we can pace it a bit more slowly. Um, we have had the court adjourn it. I've had one recently where the judge has postponed a final hearing not once but twice for the parties to mediate and even said if they hadn't uh, attended mediation by the second adjourned hearing he would possibly even consider adjourning it a third time so the referrals are coming through quicker we've all got a bit more breathing space so we've actually stepped away from the nine hour model and are sometimes just starting off by doing an hour and a half just to get a sense of where the parents are and seeing if they they want to carry on. So yes, the court the court can adjourn. And that's the judge's general discretion to case manage the case. Yes, so that is mm -hmm. helpful. But obviously, we've got to think about the factors that Janaina raised, such as domestic abuse, and you know, one party may say this may not be appropriate given allegations, but similarly, Janaina has also detailed the different kinds of mediation possible where there is domestic abuse. Mm -hmm. Okay, we have run over. Um, I'd just like to finally thank all our speakers and panellists um, and thanks everyone uh, for attending. <laughs>